Putting out fires, literally, is only part of the job for some people who work in sports. Others run a marathon in between their job responsibilities. Some of the guests I've had on the Sports in the Making podcast have shared some incredible moments in their careers and also give an inside look on what they do. These are some of the best moments through the first 19 episodes. As we reset Sports in the Making this week, you'll hear from a few of my colleagues who have had make-or-break moments working the Super Bowl, a broadcaster who made history in baseball, another who had the biggest challenge of his life juggling Olympic coverage, and yet another who's been part of building stadiums and helping a billionaire buy a sports franchise. The Sports in the Making podcast was created to let sports fans and the general public hear some great and interesting experiences they've had in sports, hear from some of what they've learned that can apply to any professional arena, and also provide some entertainment from behind the scenes. More original episodes are on the way, but for this week, enjoy this recap from some of the best people who work in sports and sports broadcasting in episode number 32. In the very first episode, I talked with Scott Hecht, one of a handful of people who has produced and directed many different sports events on TV for more than 30 years. He's a former coordinating producer and coordinating director at ESPN, working shows such as Sports Center and Baseball Tonight, and was manager of university productions for the ESPN SEC Network. Most recently, he was executive producer and manager of Syracuse University's Athletic Productions and is now Senior Associate Commissioner of Broadcasting for the Big East Conference. In this clip, he shares one of the moments that could have ended his career working on the Super Bowl. I've been so fortunate to work on lots of different shows and in, in different capacities. If, if I can give you a, another real quick memorable one, and this is a little Absolutely. bit of a story, but it's, but it, but again, for the, the people listening to this, they'll find this either humorous or they'll find it, you know, exciting. So I, I was called, I used to travel around. I used to work on NBC football and I was lucky and I was on the A, the A crew working as a replay operator. I got a call from NBC and they knew that I was doing something in San Diego. It was a super, it was a Super Bowl, whatever in San Diego, but it was the Packers and the Broncos. It was when John Elway won his first championship with the Broncos. So this would have been 90, I think it was 99, 98, 99. 98. Yeah. 98. Okay. So I got a call like two days before the Super Bowl and, and the, the crew from NBC said, look, we know you're really busy. Could you still come and do tape? You can walk on, do the show, and uh, walk off. And I said, okay, yeah, and I, I made it work in my schedule. So when I got there the day before, I remember going over to the compound and getting my credential and going to the ops producer for NBC, and I said, what am I doing? And he said, you're just doing the halftime show. And I said, okay, well, what, did, what am I doing? Like building highlight package? Just tell me what am I doing? And he said, no, you're, 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 you're working with, the people that are running the halftime show. And he said, you're going to be stationed over there. And he pointed to a horse trailer and he said, all your equipment is in the horse trailer. And so I went over and it was a stack of beta machines and they were all tied together. And he said, here's what you're doing. He said, they are going to come into the truck and they're going to say, roll it. And when you hear roll, you're going to hit this button. You're going to hit the play button on this beta. And everything, pyrotechnics, tape playback, music, everything is coming from you. And he said, do not hit the button early. If you knock the button or you hit the button, all the pyrotechnics, everything goes off and there is no stopping it. So now I am scared <laughs> to death that I'm going to accidentally hit this button during the Super Bowl. And boy, what a memorable Super Bowl that would be. I'm like, OK, so I remember... I didn't have to do anything, so I'm sitting in the I'm sitting in my horse trailer and I'm watching the game. I'm listening on headsets. I'm enjoying myself, waiting to hear when they switch over. I think it was Radio City Music Hall Productions was doing the halftime show. Diana Ross is going to fly in on a helicopter. I mean, it, and it's all predicated on me hitting this button when they say go. So everything is calm. Everything is is quiet. So now it's like three, two, one, halftime is, or the, uh, the first half is over and they're switching out in the truck, the, the production teams. And all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. You hear more screaming and yelling on headsets. And now I am trying to listen for this cue. I cannot hear. I hear so many people talking <laughs> and I don't, I, I am, I remember pressing the headsets up against my ear, just trying to hear the AD say, roll tape. And 
I can't. The whole I, show is not, dependent on you hearing it's somebody. It's all dependent on me rolling this thing on the roll queue. And this is the honest to God story. This is honest to God truth. I can't hear this one voice over probably 20 people in the front of the truck and everybody is screaming and yelling. And I am, I, I'm squishing the headset up against my ear and I'm trying to decipher out of all of these voices, this one voice saying roll tape. And I think I hear it. And, and I'm like, I'm hesitant. And it's like, roll tape. And I'm like, <gasps> and I remember pressing the button and, and I remember pushing myself back so that I don't touch anything else. And hoping to God, I heard the roll cue. Apparently I did because everything came off fine. But if you ask me the most scary moment of my life in this business, and we've all had scary moments, that was the scariest because I could see it now. I could see the headlines. Guy screws up halftime show, you know, whatever. Right. And I thought, you know, if this is not a mistake that, you know, 100,000 people are going to see. This is a mistake that millions and millions and millions of people would see. And that, that scared me to death. But um, once it, w- it rolled, I sat back and everything else, that's all I had to do. They paid me to come in and hit one button. And, and, if, and if you hadn't done that, there could have been lots of people that lost their jobs, including it, you. Absolutely. Ab- I would have been known for something that's for <laughs> sure in this business, and that would have been it. So that was a memorable moment as well, but for a different reason. In episode three, I talked with John Howard, who's worked on some very high profile events in his television career and has been a significant part of most every sports fan's experience as technical director, punching the buttons for the entire world to see, as well as calling the shots as a director. Some of those events include NASCAR, the Super Bowl, the BCS National Championship Games and NBC's Sunday Night Football. In this clip, we talk about the most challenging event he's been a part of. You know, the Super Bowls are never easy, but... It's, it's not the part of the Super Bowl that I think most people would think. The hardest part of the Super Bowl for me personally, and I think uh, I, I share this experience with other technical directors who have, have been in that position, because remember, there are only a handful of us. I think I, at last count, there were maybe 12 of us total alive today who have done the Super Bowl, uh, at least in, in, that, in the lead chair. Uh, I've been the, the uh, replay technical director for my good friend Colby Bourgeois at Fox. In fact, I will be again uh, on this Super Bowl coming up in February. Or, But I think that I can speak for all of us when I say that the most difficult part of a Super Bowl is the pregame. Because the pregame, uh, you're, you're in the chair and you're on the air sometimes an hour before mm-hmm. kickoff. You know, most networks have pregame coverage that starts at noon or 11 Eastern and goes right up to kickoff. We, we the game truck, the actual game coverage unit, we take over about an hour before kickoff. So, you know, we cover the things that happen on the field from uh, the Walter Payton Man of the, uh, of the Year Award through America the Beautiful, through the coin toss, uh, the national anthem. Uh, I will tell you that the Super Bowl in Minneapolis, uh, well, I guess it'll be three years ago now, that was probably the most nervous I've been going into mm. that pregame routine because we not only were using some virtual technology, uh, I had many pieces of my little uh, compartment of, of, of the show working for the starting lineups. The starting lineups were done, and I, I'm sure folks will remember this as I start to, to mention it, but it was a camera shooting the 50-yard line of the stadium. But at the 50-yard line, we had a virtual piece that had the actual starting lineups, the talking head lineups that I, that I run from one of my machines with a box on the side showing the teams walking to the field through the tunnel and through, through the backstage area. So I basically had both hands and both feet going (laughs) for, for, for all of these, for these two versions of lineups, uh, in the pregame. And that was the most, I won't call it stressful, but definitely the most, uh, intense moment of, of, of my career to date, because it was, everything hung in the balance on me, one wrong move by me. And this whole house of cards would have fallen down and it would, it would have looked really bad. But it worked fine. It went great, um, and, and everything uh, went off as it was supposed to. But you know, once the coin toss happens, once uh, the national anthem is over, and once they kick the ball, that's when everyone, at least in my truck and in, in the game truck, that's when we go. Okay, yeah. now we're covering the game. Now it's about the game. 
and, and then you're doing what you do. I had an associate director of my first Super Bowl at NBC who, you know, we, we always, before we go on the air, everybody hits everybody else on our intercom system individually. And we say, hey, have a great game, have a great game, have a great game. Mm-hmm. This AD was adamant that we don't say have a great game until kickoff because that's when we're covering the game. That's when we can sort of not relax, but we get into our game coverage uh, trance as opposed to yeah. <laughs> this awkward and rehearsed and, and very, uh, you know, moment by moment uh, uh, scripted pregame trance. So that's that's the hardest thing to do is is get through that on a Super Bowl, knowing that you know there's so much at stake and so many eyeballs. But knock on wood, we've managed to to make it happen perfectly uh, every time. So hopefully that'll continue. My guest on episode four helped many people get their start in television, in particular sports announcers. Chris Farrow worked at the highest level, starting with the NCAA in their broadcasting department, working on many collegiate championships, and then spent most of his career as a coordinating producer for college basketball on ESPN's Family of Networks. He most recently was coordinating producer at Ross Productions, a packager that produces games for ESPN, Fox, NBC, and other networks. Chris jump-started many well-known announcers' careers that you hear calling games of all varieties of sports and shared what he looked for when hiring for on-air positions. When I look for a new announcer or when I'm looking at tapes, I mean, now you got to remember, this is back in the day we were getting DVDs in and we were getting VHS tapes, and this isn't links like it is today. So I had a box with all the stuff in it that would just keep coming in. And I think early on I tried to organize it in a chart, and I realized, there's too many. I need to keep my charts of people working with me accurate. I can't do this. So I just kept putting them in a box. And in the springtime, we would take that box and we'd go into a large conference room. And remember the old gong show with Chuck right. Berry? Mm-hmm. We yep. would have, we would joke and we'd say, we're having gong show sessions. And we would take all the tapes and the DVDs, some of the other CPs down there, and the other great people I worked with. And we'd go in there and we'd, we'd go in for two or three hours and we'd get pizza and get some waters or sodas and you start firing them in and literally you're looking for maybe two or three out of a hundred that you think you're going to give a shot to. And that's what it really was. It was like for every, every hundred, about two or three people with somebody that we're going to try in the next basketball season or maybe football or whatever. But for me, it was mainly basketball. That's what I worked on. And it's funny. Sometimes you see somebody's real and you actually like the person they're working with better and you try to find their information. So it was so funny. And it's just like, that's how we did it. We, it was it's subjective. You know, it's it's voice quality, it's it's on camera presence, it's all the things. And you're right, you talked about the glitz reels with the great home run calls or great dunks. And those are great too, those are fun to people, but honestly you have to listen to the game. So whenever right. I talk to somebody and they say, Hey, can I send them my demo reel? I'd say actually I prefer a whole basketball game or a half a basketball game. I'm actually gonna randomly go D V D board chapter fix and see where I land in the first half. And I'm going to listen for five or ten minutes. I'm going to make my decision. That's how I did it. Well, you also have your own production company working with announcers and talent uh, to help them get better. What are the things you help them with? Yeah, I mean, I, I, once I left ESPN and I restarted Chris Farrell Productions, working from home, consulting, lots of things. Most of that consulting has been talent feedback and evaluation. We've probably done 35 or 40 people. So we have different rates for different levels of your experience level you have a college rate you have a you know your first job rate and we have if you're a seasoned veteran we have the veteran rate so we try to give people different opportunities to to get better depending on where you are where you are in your career so i always tell people you got to send me three full games if you're going to have me evaluate your stuff i want three full games now it's different for reporters we'll talk about that in a minute but obviously if you're a play-by-play or analyst we want three full games so i would split it up with again another i keep mentioning mike moore Mike works for us and does, does, does some evaluation. So we split the games up, we evaluate it, we type up notes. No different than what we used to do at ESPN for people when we had to give them feedback. We try to look for two or three themes that they do well or maybe three or four things they got to get better at. And we email to them before we have a, a call. We have a call with them. We run through everything. We answer the questions. We tell them our advice and tips about demo reels about websites, about social media, about how to connect with people without giving people's, I'm not giving people's phone numbers or emails away, but kind of like how do you, how do you be business smart? How do you succeed? How do you, what are the things you need to do on air? And that's, that's, that's what I do. It's like all the things I learned at the NCAA, at 
Creative Sports and ESPN, all these great jobs I've had, Big East, just translate them into like being able to help people and give them advice. And that's what I'm doing. Just a, a little consulting thing. Like just, it's fun to do. It's very time consuming and it's hard to do when you're having a full-time job around it. What makes a good play-by-play announcer? For me, it's got to be the voice quality. I, I have to like the voice. It's very subjective. I, I, you know, sometimes I get these reels and the total, what we call announcer voice is over the top. You know, we'll sell you the whole seat, but you only need the edge, you know, that kind of thing. Where to me, it's voice quality. Like Jason Benetti is a great one. I never knew his backstory and he sent me his reel and I liked it. I'm like, I like this guy. I like where he lived. He was in Syracuse. I go, I need a Syracuse guy. I don't have a play by play guy up there. We get clobbered with the weather. We're always bringing people from Connecticut or New York or Boston. I like this guy. I'm going to give him a shot. And I gave him the shot, and I hadn't met him yet until seven or eight years ago. And he came to visit me in Charlotte, and I had no idea, you know, with his disability. I had no idea. And that didn't change me at all. He was still going to call games at the Carrier Dome. He was still going to do the last Big East game at the Carrier Dome, regular season. He was still going to do, I think he did the Bay High 900 game. And he's been a great friend of mine. He's had the same birthday as me. We stayed in touch. And he's just one of probably, I don't know, 100 plus announcers that got their first game from me and our team in Charlotte at the time. Now, by voice quality, do you mean the sound of the voice or the conversationalism yeah. Yeah. Of, of what's going on? Yeah, just how, he's, how the person articula- articulates himself. You know, I don't need over the top. It needs to be conversational, but you got to be able to have the energy. You got to be able to, to to raise your energy level on a big call. So it just can't be boring. And it's it's hard to explain. It's just so subjective. Yeah. And sometimes I'm like, this is like kind of vanilla. We've got this person already. You know, obviously, diversity and women doing play by play is such a important part of of any national sports network. You know. Yeah. And all those things factored in all those years. Jenny Kavner was my guest on episode five back in 2020. She is a broadcaster for the Colorado Rockies on AT&T Sportsnet and made history in 2018, becoming the first woman to call play-by-play on a Major League Baseball game in the last 25 years. Jenny shared what it was like becoming the story instead of covering the story. Yeah, 25 years it had been since a female had done play-by-play on television for a baseball game. So with that, I think it sounds like a long time, but the one uh, Gail Gardner had called a major league baseball game and it actually happened to be the Rockies and the Reds on ESPN as a fill-in. So it was kind of a one-off 25 years prior to that. And there had been other women that they had tried out for a game here or there in the booth years before that. And Susan Waldman, who I want to give a lot of credit to in this, has been the longtime voice of the Yankees on radio. So Susan's been doing it for a long time. So, you know, to say, you know, you're one of the first and no woman's ever done this. I don't want to say that because I do think um, there have been women. And honestly, when I stepped in the booth, I think at the time there was at least one, maybe two women at the minor league level calling games. So nevertheless, I knew there was historical context to it and that might be a big deal because a couple of years prior in 2015, I had the chance to call a series of games on the radio as a Mm fill-in. And that that was as a color analyst. Yes, as a color analyst. So that got some publicity. Um, So I knew this probably would in that that regard, but I had no idea. Like I, I just, I don't call it naive. I had no idea the amount of attention it would get from a local scale, from a national scale. I just had no idea. So that day before, it was a Sunday, Sundays are pretty laid back at the ballpark, but I remember our producer coming up and our coordinating producer, and they were like, hey, um, Drew needs to take tomorrow off. Like, you're going to call the game. <laughs> I was just like, wait, what? And we Did you think it was a joke? I, I, I didn't because we had talked about it, and I had called the game at spring training. So I'd been in the booth and been in that position, and we had been discussing that I was going to be, you know, probably fill in some games. But we had thought originally it might be kind of a full team effort. Like, we had our analysts do an all analyst broadcast only kind of like the NBA is doing how they have all former NBA players calling games. Mm -hmm. So we're like, Hey, let's just take this opportunity. Drew Goodman's not going to take that many games off. We can kind of all, all hands on deck, have fun broadcasts, you know, make them, make them look different, sound different, just try something new. So I knew it might be coming. I just 
I, I really thought I might have some more time. To prepare yeah. for it. You would have liked <laughs> then, to have had that time to practice. Yeah, it would have been great to practice, to prepare. But again, at the same time, it was kind of good. I just had to do it because there was a lot of overthinking that I probably already did in less than 24 hours. Um, I'm sure if I had two weeks I, or a month or whatever it would have been, I probably would have done a lot of overthinking on it. So yeah, I was I was terrified. Um, I was terrified. I was excited. Kind of just all those feels. And again, having such great teammates, not just from the production side, which I'll get into in a minute, because there's a whole host of people over there that really kind of set me up for this path. But just our analysts, Jeff Houston, Ryan Spielberg, Corey Sullivan, they for years have really talked to me and brought my confidence to a point where I'm supposed to be doing this. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, we're going to try this and no one knew about it and Jenny's going to be play by play. No, it was like for a couple of years, these guys are like, even with our pre and post game show, they're like, you need to do more. You need to talk more baseball. Like, you know, just as much about this game as we do. And these were conversations that we've been having for years. So I think being able to go back to that confidence bank of just being like, okay, they trust that I'm in this spot. I better start trusting um, that I'm in this spot. That was super helpful. So that brought on the excitement part. And, you know, they're your teammates. They're pumping you up. Everyone's like getting you ready for it. So when I showed up to the ballpark, though, there were like local news got wind I was doing it. So their camera started showing up and setting up in our booth. And like, here I am. I don't even know like I have my scorebook like I normally do, but I probably need to write more things in it because I'm calling the day. Like I'm just trying to figure out uh, my routine of the day of like how I'm going to do play by play. And so it, it was it was very overwhelming. And then, you know, that night we we went out to celebrate right after and we're sitting at the bar and like Scott Van Pelt Sports Center show comes on and all of a sudden it's this huge awful outdated picture of me that they found on the internet <laughs> that, um, you know, they're saying the first female to do this in 25 years and celebrating that, which is so awesome. And Billie Jean King is tweeting me and oh, wow. it just kind of was this spiral effect that I was not, I had no idea that that kind of attention would be on the horizon. And at the same time, I quickly realized that it's so necessary, not because of me, but that that attention was out there that a female voice can call a major league baseball game, just like they can call any sport and be involved in this game on any level. And so that's where I started to realize the idea. And this, this goes full circle back to me seeing Melissa Stark on TV. I really started to see this idea that you have to see it to believe it. And I believed I could do Melissa Stark's job, but I didn't realize there were so many other jobs out there right. in our industry to do because I really didn't see anyone that looked like me doing them. Do you notice a difference in what women are able to bring to sports from their perspective or or are they doing what appears to be normal? I mean, I would hope it's just they are doing what appears to be normal. I think for, I think it's a valid question. And we talk about this a lot when we go to visit college classes. I think if you just break down gender roles, there is a softer side of a female. And I think that's where storytelling and even that relationship and those interpersonal relationships that you have to develop in a clubhouse can come into play. I mean, maybe I do get more of a story out of this guy because you know, the way I'm asking questions are different than the way a male is asking questions. But I just hope at the end of the day, it's more about like, I'm here no matter if I'm a woman or a man, and you're there no matter you're a woman or a man, because you have a passion for what you do. And because how you grew up really becomes how you see this game. And for me, again, growing up with a dad as a coach and growing up around the game of baseball specifically, but around sports a lot, it wasn't just my dad. My grandma was a huge sports fan. She was a sports nut. And I often would sit on the couch and watch basketball games with her, or I'd go to a Broncos game with her. So that also was part of my driving experience growing up and, and why I wanted to do this. In episode six, I sat down with one of the best media relations people in the business to talk about Super Bowls, the collegiate athlete, and what it takes to work in sports media. Paul Kirk has built relationships with collegiate and professional athletes spanning 30 years of his career and is currently Senior Associate Athletics Director for Strategic Communications at the University of Utah. He also spent time with the Denver Broncos during their back-to-back -back Super Bowl championship seasons in the late 1990s and shared what it was like dealing with media requests during that time. 
yeah, that was so. That was my third and fourth seasons of full time work there. So I have, I, I guess, in a way, I had just enough time to get my feet under me and learn a little bit. And and yet, it still comes at you 100 miles an hour every day. What? And thank goodness, you know, again, Jim Sacamano had been through this several times before. With you know, in the in the John Elway era, we were already you know 11 years into it by then, 12 years by the time I got there. And it was still you know very different than now, where again we didn't even have social media. It was um, you know, a different landscape. But I remember, you know, Jim sharing a couple times that, okay, you know, by now, our local media, they know how to get this done. They have their relationships. The structure we put in place for access, they're kind of on their own. Now, where we need to facilitate things one-on-one and this sit down and that sit down is mostly with the national media, who are not here as often with us, uh, who, in some cases, of course, they all had great relationships. They cover the sport. But that was where we had to put our attention. Again, yes, we, we do it all, but there's also only so many hours in a day and only so many of us. Uh, you know, there were only really three of us full time in PR at that time. And, and I'll say that pro sports NFL PR departments are not that much bigger now, which is pretty remarkable, the work they do. But we had to, to prioritize it like that, that you set up. The biggest part is really the planning with with the league and with your head coach for what the structure and, and availability and access is going to look like. And then you open the doors mm-hmm. and, you, and you manage it. And then you know when it closes and they go back to the media room. A lot of it was getting that set up. And, and Jim did a lot of that. But it's, you know, that's more of what I do now is working with the coaches to establish what is our access and, and how do we manage it. So the biggest part was putting a plan in place and then just working that plan. And then above and beyond that, you had all of the, the individual requests, the one-on-ones, the, the televising network that basically lives with you for two weeks uh, and all the different elements that go into it. You know, even at that time, it was a lot of hours of coverage and a lot of separate interviews and, and time of, of the athletes that you had to help structure for them. Yeah, and I'm sure not just the national media requests, international. How many? Exactly. How many media requests do you think you got when while you were there for the Super Bowl? <laughs> I don't even know that I could put a number on it now, but it's <laughs> funny you mention that because I when I I moved in June for for this job here at at Utah, I, when I was coming from Colorado State, I did come back across a lot of my stuff from, you know, what was 22 years ago now or 21 years ago for some of it. And in the Jim Sacomano method of the the phone message pad, it was usually it was a reporter's notebook, line by line, the message, the phone number, and and then checking them off as you went. And I still have those reporter's notebooks. And it's funny to look at the, the date down the left side, and how in those January ninety seven or um, sorry January ninety eight for the Super Bowl thirty two and then ninety nine for Super Bowl thirty three how many pages for the same day, you know, and that, wow. and that it was, it was beginning to be email at that time, but it was voicemail that while you handled one situation, that many more messages just piled up on your phone. And <laughs> it seems less efficient than the way it is now, but it just had to be done. And so, yeah, I look back at that and you could then go to other times of the year and, you know, how many weeks would go by on one page, but no, in those days, it was how many pages per day. <laughs> and wow. Some of the names, that was fascinating too, you know, names you still see in the media now, names that have retired and like, oh my gosh, I haven't thought of him or her in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> but it was everybody from everywhere, yes. I don't know what your relationship might have been with Pat Bolin, but the amount of things that everybody says about the ownership, it seems like a, a very special place to have been. Absolutely. I could not say enough great things about Pat Bolin as a person, as a franchise owner, as a boss, and everything I referenced earlier about you know being so fortunate to have gone to that franchise in that city at that time, a lot of that was that it was Pat Bolin's Broncos. And the more I learned and the more I understood about how different that was than the other 29 at the time and then 31 NFL franchises was staggering that that they're not all the same, that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I know it sounds silly to say, but yeah, the more I learned that if you're from peers around the league who have great jobs and, and really enjoyed their owners, the experience was not the same. And we were so fortunate and so blessed to work for that organization. I mean, the city and the state were fortunate to have a franchise owner who 
invested everything back into the team and trying to win. And then everything was about how do we be the best at everything? And that it was consistent with how Mike Shanahan coached and managed his team, but they were both important. Both parts of the standard that we knew we had as employees was at the very top level. And there was no margin because the emphasis was everybody's role is important. Um, not more important than something else, but if you're here, you're part of us trying to win a championship. And, and so he, he was there every day, but never in a sense that it was um, overarching or trying to micromanage everything. It was support. It was because that was where his heart and his time and everything was invested, and he loved it, and he wanted us to be successful. So that's what. So of course he'd be there, but empowered everybody to do their job and and continue to challenge themselves as far as what that is and how it contributes to the bigger picture. It was just no nonsense, straightforward. We want to win championships. Yeah. <laughs> that bowl uh, was phenomenal. And, and um, all of that um, reflection and celebration of his life when he passed away last summer really brought back a lot of memories. I had just moved to Utah and it was really interesting to watch all of it from afar and um, talk to some friends from, from back in those days like Jim uh, and others. Um, I'll always be appreciative. That's for sure. Yeah. Treated employees so well. I mean, in the time I was there, I, I went from, uh, just moving there for that job and being mid twenties and single to eventually being a father of three, all three of my kids were born while I worked there and the support for th- families when, when you had things, fantastic things like that happening or misfortune that families would go through. It was a family organization and so well supported that, these things just didn't have to happen off on the side in your own life. They were part of the Broncos organization. Carlos Alfonso may not be a name you recognize in professional baseball, but he's made a significant impact on the national pastime, spending more than 50 years in the sport, working in many different capacities as a player, manager in both minor and major league baseball, and the administration side working as director of international development with the Tampa Bay Rays and the Houston Astros. In episode 7, we talked about the different coaching roles in baseball, and in this clip, about how he was asked to join and reluctantly accepted a position as pitching coach with the San Francisco Giants. We had a situation where our field manager was Roger Craig, and I knew Roger from before because when I was a player, he was also a major league pitching coach with the Astros a couple of those years that I was in AAA pitching. So I knew of him and I knew Roger because I had done clinics in San Diego, San Diego School of Baseball owned by Roger and Tony Gwynn and Bob Cluck and Alan Trammell. So I had a pretty good idea what Roger Craig was about. And I also knew that as good as a person can be like Al Rosen to me and my family, he also was never fond of any pitching coaches, okay? So there was a lot of lot of head button between the manager and the field manager, which was Roger and, and Al. And out of the wild beyonder in the winter of 91, after I took over for Bob as a director of player development, they called me about me coming to San Francisco and bring your wife and interview for a job. I went, what? They said, the pitching coach job. And I went, oh, God. We were pushing somebody else from AAA to go to the big leagues as a pitching coach because he earned it. And here I am as a, I don't know, not a buffer, but or a compromise, I guess, between the field manager and the general manager. So in that particular day that that I became the major league coach, we had dinner, my wife and I, Roger and his wife, Al and his wife, and Mr. Lurie was the owner. In the interim, I knew that this is going to be a one-year type of job, only because I felt that, A, Mr. Lurie at that time had gone through three different attempts to trying to get a new ballpark to replace Candlestick. Two, if he didn't, he might have sold the club. So I'm thinking this may be a one-year deal because I'm not sure this is going to happen. Plus the fact that I knew the inner makings or the politics of everything in between the field manager and the general manager. So from that, one of them had said, you know what, Bob, Mr. Lurie, I don't think that Carlos wants the job. And it was funny because, you know, I really didn't. (laughs) Out of that. 
came that I went to Mr. Lurie in the middle of the dinner and said, am I more valuable to you in 1992 as the pitching coach or your director of player development? And he goes to me and says, I want you to be the pitching coach. I said, okay, you got it. (laughs) That's interesting. On the Sports in the Making podcast, I not only talk about sports and broadcasting with my guests, but also the business side of the industry. Dennis Spencer joined me on episode eight to talk about sports rights. Dennis was executive vice president of Lagadere Sports and Entertainment back in 2020 and is now in a similar role at Sport 5, a sports and entertainment agency. We talked about how broadcasters spend huge amounts of money on rights and how it's a daunting task to get viewers to tune in. It really is. And, you know, part of what's hard is the event or the, you know, the client that everyone, they all say, particularly when we're talking about, I guess, kind of third country rights or or third party rights. By that, I mean rights in countries, not their own. So, you know, for example, the Chicago Marathon, I'm talking about all the the, the rights for all the countries outside the United States. So what happens is, the, the rights holders tend to say what's really important to us is we want to build our brand. We want to become known because that will create more social media traffic. That will create more merchandise sales. We need more eyeballs on the event so that the sponsors will be happy so that we can get, go get more sponsors. But at the end of the day, as in my experience, it almost always comes down to money. That event would much rather have the money than the eyeballs. Yeah. But finding that balance, as you said, is, is, is very, very challenging. So with a property like Chicago Marathon, or even one that has even more tradition, like the Boston Marathon, how tricky or complex is it to try and monetize something like that? Because one is high profile and one isn't. So how do they monetize it? Yeah, I, I think the, you know, the, the smaller marathons they, they may they may have streaming coverage, but primarily you don't see big blown out coverage for let's say the Houston Marathon or the White Rock Marathon in Dallas or the Marine Corps Marathon here in Washington D.C. where I am. So, so there's really not a monetization play of any significance for the smaller marathons. Right. One, you know, it's it's really expensive to produce a marathon. You know, and you need a good three hour block of time. And it's not the most, um, as much as I love it, it's not the most compelling television. It can be if you get a great race, but um, the, those the moments that that are really exciting are, uh, you know, sometimes kind of hard to find. But then when you get to you know Boston and Chicago that have so much historical significance, particularly Boston, then it's uh, it's still a challenge to to monetize them, and, and in New York City. But you've you've got to deliver quality television to a wide audience for the sponsors, yeah, uh, primarily, and also there's just a, a ton of interest in them. So, so those aren't the the, the big races command nice rights fees. Um, you know, they have good production and good international streams of revenue as well. On episode nine, I spoke with Dean Walker, a sports media executive who spent time with Universal Sports and NBC Sports. He was an early pioneer in the -the over-the-top model for viewers watching sports they wanted while with World Championship Sports Network. For the PyeongChang Olympics coverage on NBC, he had one of the most challenging assignments in all of sports broadcasting and explains the complexities of what went into that role. For the last Olympic Games, the PyeongChang Games, I was one of these at-home supervising producers. For the Olympics, there's usually two units. There is the production unit and the operations unit that are on site at the Games. Then there are the production and operations teams that are U.S.-based. So I worked in that capacity of overseeing the production teams on the U.S. side of the operations. So what that meant was, you know, coordinating the different crews that were working on the various events. The the thing you have to remember about the PyeongChang Games was this was the first time that there ever was 24-hour, seven-day-a-week coverage of the Olympic Games, and that was primarily on NBCSN. 
but it was also went across all the different networks, USA, CNBC, the network itself. And so a lot of those different sports were being coordinated on the the domestic side of the operations. And so that was part of, I was part of the team that was overseeing all the different shows, all the different events that were running through the U.S. facility and being sent out to the, the American audience on the different networks of NBC. How hectic is it managing all of those sports coming in at all hours of the day? That was probably one of the greatest challenges of my career for many different reasons. First of all, because the the Olympics were happening in South Korea and we were being live for most of the time, we were having to work on Korean time. So basically, if something was happening at 3 p.m. in Korea, that meant it was happening at 3 a.m. on the East Coast. That was a definite challenge, not only for us in the you know management roles, but for everybody who was you know basically having to shift their body clocks to work on Korean time. It was very challenging in the fact that we were coordinating multiple sports coming into uh, the facility all simultaneously. We'd have to make sure it was getting to the proper production group who was working specifically on that sport. And then all of that content was having to get to the proper network. We would have three, sometimes four different control rooms going simultaneously. We'd have multiple playback rooms doing different network shows simultaneously. It was probably the most intricate operation I've ever been a part of because there were so many different moving parts going across so many different NBC properties that you always had to keep your eye on everything that was going on. That is true of any Olympic Games because, you know, let's let's compare it to FIFA World Cup. There may be two or three soccer games going on at the same time, but it's not the same as 10 to 15 to 20 different sports happening at the same time that you're trying to get out to your audience that is consuming the Olympic Games. When you look at it from that perspective, the Olympics are probably one of the greatest sports broadcasting challenge anybody can take on. When it comes to minor league baseball, I asked my guest Jimmy Serrano about how players manage their contracts and what happens with the instruction at the single A, double A, and triple A clubs. Jimmy played with various teams in the minor leagues and had a short stint in the bigs with the Kansas City Royals as a pitcher. Here's a short clip from episode 10. I think initially in the lower levels, you're not really, you don't really have a say. It's, it's kind of, you're there and you're under contract and, you know, you grind it out and hope something happens. As you get into the, the higher levels of baseball, obviously money becomes more of a priority, how much you're getting paid. And, and also you look at, you know, what are the chances of, of getting to the big leagues? You know, are they fully stacked at your position or have they been, you know, calling guys up at your position. So you you take all that into account. And, you know, the, those are the things that you look at when you're signing as a free agent with a different team. With the different levels of minor league baseball, single A, double A, triple A, what are the different types of instructions that you get at each level? So at the lower levels of professional baseball, there's a little bit, uh, I guess I'd say it's a little more hands-on mechanically for like a a pitcher, I guess, and hitting as well, where they want to make sure that you have good mechanics and technique and stuff like that. That's more at the the lower levels. As you get up in the levels of baseball, it's more about the mentality and how have you learned to coach yourself? And, you know, do you know what makes you successful? You know, and then it becomes more about communicating with the coaches. So like at the, the AAA level or even the big league level, you know, you have to communicate with the pitching coach, you have to say, here's what I tend to do. Here's what happens when I'm, when I'm not on. So can you help keep an eye out for these types of things? And then it's just your, your bullpen sessions and things like that. It's more about a conversation uh, from pitch to pitch rather than, you know, the, the pitching coach is not going to come in to a triple A guy, triple A pitcher and say, all right, we're going to change this. We're going to change that. Uh, it, it's more like you got to that level and 
you know, pitching coach is more or less there to, to help continue to guide you. Ben Balma was my guest on episode 11, and there was so much great information on how sports work that I split it into two episodes. So check out 11 and 12. We talked about his career as a sports producer with ESPN, NBC, and other networks. We had worked many of the same events through the years, and you may have seen him on the field after a Super Bowl or World Series. So I thought I'd find out more about what he did and was surprised to find out that he was involved in much more than just broadcasting, including being a part of building the Pittsburgh Pirates PNC Park, and he also helped billionaire Terry Pagula buy an NHL team. And so I spent two summers between uh, my junior and senior year and after I graduated, interning in the PR department of the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so that was my first foray of kind of getting wet into this industry and obviously, once you look around, you start to learn and learn and learn. But I ended up going back to the Pirates in uh, 1996. I left the Washington Capitals to take that job. And literally three weeks after I got hired is when Kevin McClatchy bought the Pittsburgh Pirates. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, here I'm thinking, geez, I just picked up from an NHL job, moved back to Pittsburgh. Oh, my God, this guy's going to come in. He has all these people that he's going to hire and I'm going to be out of a job. Well, fortunately, you know, at the time, Kevin's 33 years old, pulled off a miracle just to get the franchise. My boss had already gone down to spring training because it's mid-February already. So I spent the next three weeks as Kevin's liaison. We did every breakfast meeting, every radio show, every lunch, and every banquet to introduce Kevin to the community. What a great and opportunity. We well, and at the time, I didn't really look at it more as an opportunity. You know, in retrospect, yes, because everything was happening a million miles an hour. Here's a young guy spending money to keep this team in Pittsburgh and promising to build a ballpark. And so I kind of bonded with Kevin and it, it was a good thing because obviously it means I was keeping my job. But right. then literally that summer and that fall is when we started the process of trying to get PNC Park built. And it really taught me the intricacies of how does a franchise deal with a city? How do we find the financing for a ballpark? How do you market it? How do you sell it so the public will buy into it? You know, all these things that, that people really don't know and how hard, how literally hard it is to get these things done. So it was like another internship for me, even though I was working full time. So it really, really taught me some of the intricacies. Then when I left there, getting the ballpark done was just phenomenal. And, and the things I learned, and it's you know still to this day, one of the best ballparks out there. But I never really looked at it as a springboard until later to some other things. So for years, having played hockey at Penn State, we had tried to get a rink built there because in 1993, when Penn State went into the Big Ten, they were designing this beautiful on-campus arena you know, for the basketball team. Old Rec Hall, which had been there for 70-some odd years, was starting to get old. Penn State's moving to the Big Ten, and they're designing this beautiful arena. Well, some bean counter in the design of the arena crossed off the ability to put pipes and an ice compressor into the facility which you're like why wouldn't you do that you know whether it's ice capades coming to town right. or a penguins flyers preseason game like it literally at that in 1993 it cost like three hundred thousand dollars to do it it's literally nothing to make sure the pipes are in the cement floor forever well some bean counter like didn't know the importance of it and didn't put them in so for years penn state hockey had no great place to play so alums like myself and guys who played there for a long time and, and loved the hockey program had tried for years to get a, a donation or some money going to get a new arena built on campus. And we're all about 20 years later, ready to give up. And out of the blue, we're introduced to Terry Pagula. And, and people who don't know who Terry Pagula is, he's now the current owner of the Buffalo Sabres and the Buffalo Bills. But Terry's a Penn State grad. And he had always maintained an affinity for the school, had been one of the pioneers in fracking and made his fortune in the oil and gas industry. And we met him and, you know, kind of told him our plate and got him very interested. And he, his original donation was like, Hey, how, how would $10 million help? And that is nothing, <laughs> nothing to sniff at, right? Like $10 million is not pocket change and it's a donation. And the school that even at that time was still very reticent. We're like, they're like 10 million is okay, but it's not going to get the job done. And Terry goes, well, what about 20? Uh, that's good, but that's still not going to get it done. And we're literally looking at each other like $20 million isn't good enough. Yeah. And, and we had done some work behind the scenes. And at that point, you know, an arena would cost, pro if you wanted to do it right, somewhere between 65 and $75 million to do it right. So here is, you have a guy literally willing to write a $20 million check. You have the school saying no. And I'm like, I'm just mind boggled by this. Okay. 
Now, at this stage, Terry finds out he's going to finish a deal with Royal Dutch Shell for about $4.6 billion in cash. Okay. Not, not M, but with a B. Yeah. And so now at this point, Terry's pretty confident the deal's going to be finished soon. And he goes, well, how about 40 million? I'm like, well, school's not turning down 40 million. So I go back to the school and talk to the athletic director about a plan to spend that $40 million to retrofit that arena that had been built in 1993, get the pipes. It's, it's actually built for hockey as, as far as the seating configuration, but you know, get the pipes in, get the locker rooms in, da, 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 like the $40 million would have covered it. And he says, he goes, well, let me get back to you. And he says, the school still doesn't want to do it. And I go, wow. wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that the school is going to turn on a $40 million donation. And, and he's like, yeah, he goes, they do, they do not want to shut the building down for six to eight months as long as it would take because they're afraid they'd lose all this revenue. And I was like, I literally felt at this point, like, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And I said to Tim Curley, the athletic director, who I loved, and I said, uh, I said, Tim, with my connections in the media, do you really want me to go out and call like USA Today and ESPN and say, hey, Penn State just turned down $40 million <laughs> because of something stupid and he's like well that's kind of where we are right now I'm like and now i'm just beyond frustrated so a couple weeks later we're at boston university checking out the hockey arena there the agana center which is gorgeous it's one of the better hockey facilities in the country and we're meeting with mike ruzioni and he's giving us a tour and we finished the tour and we happen to walk out uh, on the commonwealth ave and the phone rings and it's terry pagula and he goes guys the deal's done what do you need <laughs> so basically the full cost of getting the new hockey arena built and the scholarships uh, endowed was $88 million. He's like done. So now at this point, so it was doubled. Yeah. So not, yeah, he's no, but at this point he's like, basically just tell me what you need. I'm yeah. not going to throw a number out. Just tell me what you need. Right. So now, now we're able to go back to the school and go, look, you got no choice now, guys. Like he's writing the full check. It's done. So Terry just an amazing, I mean, to, to think of that donation, the number went up to 102 million because when they added women's hockey, we had to, we had to build more locker rooms and oh, scholarships right. and so forth. So the total, the total bill was $102 million. And that's just an unbelievable gift on any level for that guy to make. So we make the announcement at Penn State and it's going to be amazing and everybody's excited. So we're out that night with Terry, about four or five of us. And I jokingly say to Terry, now, Terry, I can do the math. <laughs> you can afford an NHL team. Have you thought about it? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I've, you know, I've, I've thought about it in the past. And I said to him, well, what's more important to you, the logo on a chest or getting into the club of ownership? And he goes, he goes, well, and I'm thinking at the time, like, he's going to say, you know, I love the Rangers or I love Chicago or bought, like one of the big market teams. He goes, well, I'm actually the world's biggest Buffalo Sabres fan. And I'm like looking huh. at him like, what? Like, what are the odds a guy worth $4.6 billion you know, wants the Buffalo Sabres? And I said, <laughs> I said, that doesn't make sense. Like, tell me the story. So Terry actually had grown up around the Scranton area. And when the Flyers and the Sabres played in the 1975 uh, Stanley Cup Finals, Terry fell in love. He was able to watch it because, you know, Scranton's proximity to Philadelphia. But he said, I fell in love with the French Connection, the famous uh, top line of the Buffalo Sabres, which was... Rick Martin, Gilbert Perrault, and Rene Robert. And so he always had an affinity. Then, later on, Terry moves his company to Western New York, becomes a season ticket holder, loves the team, yada, yada. So he's telling me this story, and I'm like, wow, this is real. Like, holy cow. Um, so his story has legitimacy, and it kind of reminded me of Robert Kraft. You know, people know Robert Kraft was a New England Patriots season ticket holder, and finally worked and made enough money to buy his team, and, and look what he's done with it. So I'm and I said, Terry, that's an amazing story. I said, but, you know, as far as I know, they're not for sale. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, you know, I called them last year and they weren't interested. And he's got a cigar in one hand and a glass of wine into the other. And he literally says, the hell with it. And he calls them again the next morning. He calls the Buffalo Sabres the day after we finished the Penn State deal. All right. So he's just made a $102 million after. donation. Yeah, he's made this donation to Penn State. And now we've got his gears turning and now he calls him and now the Buffalo Sabres ownership now knows like he's what he's worth and says, Hey, let's talk. And so we, we made an application to the league a few weeks later and because it's not the way it used to, you know, they want to vet their potential owners. They match the two and then you do the due diligence. So the league said, okay, you guys are free to talk. We got on the ground right before Christmas and he had the team by Valentine's day. 
So again, the whirlwind, the Penn State deal, the Buffalo Sabre deal added on to kind of the internship I had learning about, you know, PNC Park and the Pirates ownership and all that. Like I had now gone through this amazing wealth of almost like classes to learn how deals get done. Each deal is unique. Each circumstance is unique. Each buyer, each owner, each league, each opposing owner, they're all unique. So you really have to know how what the match is, what the money is, the financing, um, the spreadsheets on the team and how it functions. You know, I'm, I'm literally learning on this stuff on the fly, having never thought about it, having never prepared for it. And I'm, I'm in the deep end of the pool. Uh, And just to be able to learn all that on top of everything else I was doing, not something I planned, but it's an incredible wealth of information and knowledge that I got to, to experience and be privy to. Covering a sports event isn't possible without the mobile television trucks that need to work flawlessly during a broadcast, but the reality is that it's not always possible. Brian Nupnow of Game Creek Video joined me on episode 13 to share what it's like to keep a TV truck running properly even when there is chaos, like a fire, that affects the show. And the thing with this, you know, being mobile television, you can never assume anything. It can be the the smallest show, you can be doing a little four camera show and the truck could literally catch fire. I mean, that's happened before. You can have things not show up. You can have trucks getting an accident. That's happened before where they show up and you can't open the bay doors. Um, We've had trucks go over the mountains and they come in and everything in the bays is packed in snow. You know, it just, or the side could even be frozen shut. You really don't know what you're going to run into any day. So you've literally had to put out fires on some of the shows you've worked on. Has there been more than one? I've had several, actually. Um, one that stands out, I was doing a, a Lakers NBA game in Utah, and they were, just got into overtime, and the truck shut down. So I went outside, and there was actually a fire in the power bay. So I put that out, and in the meantime, the uh, the producer, director, it was the same person, was letting me know their displeasure of the whole thing while they are standing over me. I was able to get in the power bay and strip the wire back and put everything back on. The wire had actually burned off the transformer. We were down for seven and a half minutes and we got back up on the air and the game was still going on. They had started the second overtime at this point. We finished out the game that way. Wow. But yeah, you just, you never know. You can never assume anything on these shows. I was doing a race once and the truck was actually hit by lightning. It came in through the phone lines. We found out later the, the, the phone block was not grounded. So it, it took the hit and then brought it into the truck that way. And it actually arced on the side of the truck we could see where it was melted a little bit on the on the I.O. Inside the truck, where I happened to be at the time, I saw the flash of lightning inside the truck. Wow. And the truck didn't actually go down, but a lot of things didn't work afterwards. We lost all of our graphics machines, the audio board, the uh, switcher, the, uh, uh, the intercom. Everything went down at that point, and nothing worked. And the, and the uh, director and producer and the tech manager came to me and said, what do you need? And I said, I need everybody to get out. There were so many broken things in the truck at that point. And I was on my own at that time because the other engineer who was supposed to be working with me who had done a show the night before and his plane got canceled. So I was I was there by myself. And I said, I just need everybody to leave. And fortunately, they, they did that. And they said, okay, we, had, we were on the air the next day at 10. And I stayed there all night and I got enough stuff working to, to do a show the next day. But it was literally some trips to Best Buy to buy graphics cards and power supplies and some spares I had on the truck and then just kind of scavenging from what was around in the area. And I was able to get enough stuff to, to do a show, but yeah, those kind of things happen. Athlete agent Heather Novickis joined me to talk about the athlete agent relationship and how Olympic athletes need storytelling to help them build their brands and get sponsorships. Episode 14 was informational in how agents build relationships with amateur athletes. I agree, Don. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. Olympic athletes or amateur athletes, traditionally, as they've been called, don't often have the benefit of one high paying endorsement deal in the same way that a lot of team athletes do. If you're talking about NFL, NBA, MLB, soccer, well, men's soccer, traditionally, anyways. So I think with Olympic athletes, it it really is more about identifying those three or four, five or six meaningful partnerships that collectively are going to help support the athletes training, cover their coaching costs, their travel, their nutrition, their equipment needs. So that I think when you talk about representing an Olympic athlete, 
there's more that goes into it. You don't just, I think, execute a quick shoe deal and okay, you're done and, and move on to the next athlete. It's an ongoing process that evolves as uh, I get to know the athlete more and more. And I have always said that the, the more I can get to know an athlete and understand their personality, what drives them, what their background is, what makes them tick, something unique about their family, their health history, whatever it might be, the better job I can do of identifying unique opportunities in the marketplace to pursue. How are you able to develop those relationships? Uh, because that seems like it takes a lot of time and effort and trust. Trust is a good word. And, and, I, and I do think that's key. I, I think to start working with an athlete, you know, a lot of times there's, there's hesitation, I think, on their part that we try and manage, my, and by we, my business partners at Human Interest Group and I try and manage effectively with reasonable expectations. And it's a conversation that, you know, we need to have, I think, upfront at every, the onset of every relationship um, with new clients. And I think there's a lot of expectations sometimes with athletes that, oh, if I sign an agent, I'm going to get a car deal, or I'm going to get this lucrative apparel deal. And any agent that ever tells an athlete that is lying. So you always got to take a look at the big picture and just say, look, it's a process and we have to start somewhere. And that's where the trust comes in. And it's trust, trust the process and know that we're in this together and we're going to start building and working together. And, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but together we'll start laying the foundation as agents. We'll start getting exposure uh, get your foot in the door with some smaller sponsorship deals that we can then grow into bigger and bigger opportunities. So there is a process and you're absolutely right. There's a lot of trust that's wrapped up into that agent athlete representation process. Mary Kate Shea spent a good portion of her career with the financial services company, John Hancock as the senior director of sports marketing and sponsorships and is now with the Boston athletic association. She has one of the more unique jobs in sports that of selecting the elite runners for the Boston Marathon. In this clip, Mary-Kate shares what her role is like the week leading into Marathon Monday and how she runs the marathon in between her race responsibilities. This was episode 15. I wish GPS watches were never invented because I think it was last year I just took a look at my watch and how far I'd walked the day before and it was 10 miles. <laughs> and that, that, that was just walking. So walking... You know, Friday is the big press conference, so we bring in all of the open elite athlete team as well as the defending champions, the wheelchair champions, and um, the open champions. We have a cadre of ambassadors, which include Bill Rogers, Shalane Flanagan, Joni Benoit, Greg Meyer, Tatiana McFadden, um, uh, uh, just great people who represent the sport well, Uda Pippik and to bring them all together. So that really is the kickoff. And throughout that day, all the athletes will have media obligations. They'll have expo obligations, other sponsor obligations. And we just try to make sure that they're resting when they can rest and not getting too busy. We'll take groups out to the finish line for surprise meet and greets mm. with anyone who just happens to be passing. And that's really popular. Uh, sometimes we'll do news panels. New York Times had a nice panel. And then um, over at the Expo, they have some nice runner panels. So Friday and Saturday are pretty busy. And then Sunday, I pretty much tell everybody they just need to eat and sleep and rest and chat. And uh, just, you know, that's when the laser focus comes in and you'll see you'll see the demeanors completely change. And people are really in tune with uh, what task lies ahead of them and what they have to do on Monday Patriots Day. Yeah. So it's it is a whirlwind, you know, on Thursday we have a tradition that's now I think 3 decades old uh where the Kenyan athletes, so usually about 10 to 15, go out to Hopkinton to the right. elementary school and meet with the third graders. We'll do different things in the city at the Reggie Lewis. So we do keep them busy, uh, but not too busy because they are here to race and they need to rest. Now, you mentioned earlier uh, Marathon Monday is one of your favorites. I've been there. I've seen the behind the scenes. I've seen how you interact with these athletes that are checking in. And what surprised me, and I kind of chuckled the first couple of times, you make sure they have their bibs, but you ask if they have both shoes. Is there something yes. that has happened in the past that, that has gone awry? 
No, no one has ever okay, forgotten good. their shoes. And that's the reason I ask and I actually look at the shoes. <laughs> yeah, you need your shoes. I know they're dressed when they come down there. So even if they don't have, you know, the, the, the their favorite set of shorts, I know they'll, they'll have clothing. But um, a few of the agents go out too and they, they always carry a bag of gear and everybody shares whatever they have when you get out there, especially if the weather changes dramatically. So you, yeah, you, you get them on the bus, you take them out mm-hmm. to Hopkinton. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's the state troopers close down the Mass Pike. So mm-hmm. it's just, we have three buses in case one <clears throat> or two bus buses break down, the whole group can fit on one bus. So it's very well orchestrated. And then we get out in Hopkinton and um, usher them into a Korean church, uh, which they've been housed at for probably 30 years, which is wonderful. It's right next to the starting line. And they'll kind of zone out. They cover themselves with a few blankets or towels. They're sitting on yoga mats. They're doing light stretching. And then about 20 minutes before their race start time, they'll go out and do some running uh, in the back of the church. And then I'll have a roll call, which is very stressful for me because I don't want to forget anybody. Mm -hmm. And um, I line them up and then we walk out the shoot, the national anthem, the flyover, and get everybody on the start. We'll do a call out for media of about four to five of the top athletes. They'll give a wave to the camera. And then I back away, get back to the church for the next group, and the elites are off. So, yeah, yeah. it's pretty uh, pretty methodical at this point, but still a little nerve-wracking because, you know, I've had elites throw – watches at me that they now don't want to wear or uh one <laughs> one ethiopian athlete um thought the the donation bags along the side of the course were elite bags and she threw her warm up in there with her passport in it so <clears throat> so that was a little traumatic <laughs> trying to get her out of the country afterwards but we did yeah we got her her passport back all right i'm talking with mary kate shea senior director of sports marketing and sponsorship with john hancock All right, Mary-Kate, the guns go off, Mm -hmm. the runners are on the course. What wave do you run in, and how long does it take you? So after I get everybody off, I uh, jump back into the church and just get my bib on, and I will go in wave two. Then last year, it was a 344 for me, and um, I'm an old person, so I took that and celebrated heartily uh, that evening because... uh, that was a good run for me. And I got to run 10 miles of it with my youngest daughter, who's 25. And uh, that was just special. All four of my children have run yeah. uh, Boston. So that was great. And as we talked before the podcast started, this is going to be your 24th. This one coming up will be my 24th consecutive. And I managed to qualify for all of them except for one where I was injured and I missed by five minutes. But I belong to a great running uh, club here, and uh, we do a lot of volunteering. So I was able to secure an invitational bib that way and uh, kept my streak going. So so even so though you work good. with the Boston Athletic Association and John Hancock, you still have to qualify. Um, I think it's a point of honor for me, yeah, to, you know, be authentic. When it comes to interviewing athletes, some of the best answers come from former athletes themselves. NBC track and field analyst, sprinting coach, and four-time Olympic medalist Otto Bolden shared what he learned about Dr. John Carlos, the Olympic sprinter who raised his fist in protest at the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City. This insight from his interview appeared in episode 16. Well, I have to give you a little bit of the backstory, and that is that I don't know who you had on your wall, <laughs> what posters you had on your wall when you were when you were in high school. I guess my friends would have had, I don't know, Janet Jackson or Michael Jackson, whatever. I had those guys on my wall. They went to San Jose State. I did my final year of, of high school in San Jose. I, I grew up spending my summers in San Jose. My uncle, that same uncle that I referenced before, taught those guys at San Jose State. So they were always very prominent in my upbringing. And I came to understand very early in my life what a big sacrifice those guys had made, how important that that gesture was, even if people didn't understand it at the time and they were ostracized at the time. Mm-hmm. So when I became an athlete and got a chance to meet those guys, and they were doing that interview with, with Dr. John Carlos, I was sort of the only person they could have picked because it's like, 
oh yeah, let Otto do that because he knows John and he knows that story inside and out. Um, in terms of what I learned doing the interview that I didn't know, I was surprised to hear it's one thing that stuck with me. I, they aired it again the other day, and, and, and I watched it because my, my DVR set to tape everything track and field. When John Carlos says to me, yeah, 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 Otto, of course you don't understand me saying my only point, my only focus once I had made the Olympic final is let me just get on this podium so we can do whatever it is that we're, we're going to decide to do. The reason why that's hard for you to believe is because you grew up in an era where the Olympics were money and mm -hmm. fame and commercials and bonuses and contracts. For me, the Olympics was just another meet. And I went, oh my gosh, of course, in my own little bubble, I can't picture what the Olympics were in 68. Right. The Olympics in 68, you know, there, there was no contract. There was, he was, he was not going to do a single thing for his, for his bank book by winning that race or for even being in the race or going to the Olympics. And he drove that point, that point home so strongly for me that I just, even in the course of conducting that interview, I just went, Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. I get it. And if anybody hasn't seen it, it's called bring the fire, a conversation with John Carlos. Uh, and you can find it on NBC sports uh, platforms. I thought you asked some really good questions and you had a, a really good rapport with, uh, with John Carlos. And it's really hard to get that with athletes. Uh, and you had a conversation about uh, something that was life changing. Yeah. I think that um, they have a good philosophy at, at, at NBC and Jack Felling who produced that. Uh, and Jack Felling is, is, as you know, is just awesome at what he does. Uh, most of the pretty stuff and, and, and the good and the great pieces that you see during, during, not just the Olympics, just anything big that we have on NBC is, you know, is, is produced by Jack Felling. And Jack Felling has a concept, and I agree with him. He says, athletes talk more freely with other athletes than anybody else. They could have used Tariko or anybody else to do that interview, but there's certain things that John Carlos is going to tell me and is a way that he's going to tell it that I think is different than he would that he would say to anybody else that's a non-athlete. And I've always heard Jack say that. And every time I see an athlete conduct an interview with another athlete and it comes off really well, I go, yep, that's, you know, Jack's always said, you put musicians to sit down and interview other musicians, the interview is going to be different. You put actors to sit down and talk to other actors, that interview is going to be different. And at NBC, I think that's something that we, um, that we believe and we've, we've gotten good results with. And finally, to wrap up this recap episode of Sports in the Making, I'm including a clip of my conversation with Nick Ismondi, who has held various hosting, reporting, and analyst roles with Universal Sports, NBC Sports, and multiple NHL hockey teams, including the Las Vegas Golden Knights, the Chicago Blackhawks, and the Seattle Kraken. It's a great listen on how to never give up and some advice on making opportunities for yourself. When I was in Michigan, I was rising quickly. I was a 15-year-old on the radio, suddenly on Fox Sports Radio, which was a major radio station, uh, AM radio station in Detroit. And I was writing for the Detroit Free Press. And I was on TV every couple of days, even when I was doing radio. And so I was, I was on sort of this, I was, it was a little bit of a meteoric rise. And, and I, I was... I was doing the one thing that you're not supposed to do and you're reading your own press. And, you know, I started to believe that, wow, okay, well, maybe, maybe it's time to move on. Maybe it's time to jump out of Detroit. And I think I jumped a little faster than I probably should have um, looking at it in retrospect. I, I took a big leap and I left Michigan at a very young age. I was 20 something years old, 21 years old. And I moved to Los Angeles and you go from being a, a big fish in a little pond to being an absolute minnow in in ocean and uh that's where i found myself in la and it, it, the reality hit hard it was it was difficult to find work it was difficult to even get a interview it was difficult to get an agent it was difficult you know all of these different things were kind of smacking me down and you know i moved to los angeles in, in 2005 and I, uh, I basically struggled. Um, you know, I was picking up a little bit of voiceover work here and there, but wasn't really able to get in any big productions, wasn't really able to get any gigs. Like I was, 
I was coaching hockey on the side to make a little bit of money and doing lessons and things like that and and picking up voiceover work here and there. Um, but it was a struggle and ran out of money. You know, um, in 2007, it was Christmas Eve. I'm sorry, 2000. It was, yeah, it was 2006, 2006 Christmas Eve. And I was flying back to Detroit and I had basically resolved that I was going to fly to Detroit and talk to Fox Sports and see about maybe getting my gig back in Detroit. And I went to the hotel, the, the, the bar in uh, LAX and my flight was delayed. It was Christmas Eve. I wasn't going to make it home till like 1 a.m. Christmas Day. Um, so I was just down and out. And I, I, I remember I ordered a Jack and Coke. And I sat down at the bar and I wasn't even sure my credit card would ring through to pay for the Jack and Coke. I was already in my mind. I was already concocting and you know me well. I was already concocting the story on how I was going to get out of paying for that drink. A lady came up and sat down next to me and just saw that I was kind of down in the dumps and struck up a conversation. And uh, basically her and her husband were boarding a flight to go home as well. And the gentleman overheard me talking to his wife about the fact that I was out of work and looking for a job and et cetera, et cetera, and that I was a sportscaster and that I used to do hockey and snowboarding. Well, the guy starts laughing and he looks at me and he goes, you're serious. And I said, yeah, I'm serious. And he goes, well, he goes, I was just telling my wife in the car ride over here to the airport that I'm stressed out because by the first of the year, I've got to find a hockey and snowboarding play-by-play announcer for this sports network that we're running. And uh, sure enough, that gentleman was the executive producer of what was then uh, WCSN, World Championship Sports Network, uh, which turned into, as I was saying earlier, Universal Sports and NBC Sports. And uh, I basically got hired in the bar over a Jack and Coke on Christmas Eve in 2006 and started working for them uh, the second week of January 2007. (laughs) What's the best advice that one you've been given and two uh, that you would give. Yeah, just experience means everything. I mean, experience means everything from as young of an age as you can get it. Nobody has ever once asked me where I went to college. They all want to know what you've done and where you've been and how you've been on air. And then they want to know how you're doing in that space. So if you're a young aspiring broadcaster, start getting your reps in now and you can get on a radio station. You can do an internship, but, Geez, I started broadcasting. I would, I would, this was before the internet was even around. Like I had to, I would get the morning paper and, uh, you know, I'd sit in my living room in, in, in Plymouth, Michigan. And I would, I would fold the paper so that I had the roster of the Detroit Red Wings and the roster of the team that they were playing that night. And I would sit in front of the TV with the game on mute and I would just announce it. I would just call the action and I would get used to the speed of it. And I would get used to filling the, the, the empty space with words when, when, when you needed to and being creative with it. So for me, the best advice that I can give anybody that wants to get into this business is get as much experience as you can, even if you manufacture it on your own. If you like this episode, please be sure to subscribe to at sports making on YouTube or your preferred podcast listening platform. More great episodes are on their way, and if there's someone that works in sports that you'd like to hear from, drop a comment on YouTube or on the Facebook page. Thank you for listening to Sports in the Making. I'm your host, Don Cardona.